Well, Apollo 13, uh, in terms of its flight uh, experience up to the time of the event, it was a very nominal kind of flight. Now, we did have a premature shutdown on the stage uh, during ascent, but there was enough ascent performance margin to go ahead and get into orbit and have a nominal mission. So the, the process of launching, uh, dwelling in Earth orbit for a couple of revs, uh, uh, relighting the uh, third stage to take us to the moon, that all came off very nominal, uh, with the exception of that one anomaly I mentioned, up until about 48 hours. One of the things that always happens invariably as you got, as you, uh, after you finish the insertion burn from the Earth to transfer to the moon, the, the crew settled down to essentially what was called housekeeping, because you were in a coast period there without, without, a, without a lot of mission activities to do. And of course, one of the things we always wanted to watch was how is the spacecraft going to settle in to a coast period? How the, how the system's going to settle down, how's the crew going to settle into adjusting to this housekeeping mode? Because we mostly train to high intensity phases of the mission, launch, landing uh, of, the, of the lunar module, landing of the command module. And uh, one of the things that we uh, always needed to uh, space special attention to was the crew doing their normal housekeeping functions, you know, pre and post sleep checklist, watching those settle in. And for the first two days of the flight, it was very, very nominal. Uh, so it was an uneventful flight uh, from that standpoint. The, the mission was very nominal for 48 hours. I was off, I was off the console and at home when, uh, when the event happened. In fact, I was, if I remember, I was shaving at the time, and my boss called me. My boss's name was Arnie Aldridge. He worked in one of the back rooms here and uh, said, John, uh, these guys are chasing a problem out here, and uh, they think it's some kind of an instrumentation problem because it, the problem doesn't all correlate and make sense. Uh, and since you're also the one of the things you do back in the office is you're the instrumentation expert, uh, which is the you know, remote reading of all the vehicle measurements that we get on telemetry. Uh, I need to ask you to ask your opinion on something. And I said, well, okay, Arnie, uh, give me some readouts. I said, go behind the uh, GNC console operator and, and, and call up display so-and-so and give me some readouts. Uh, he'd, he'd read me out a few parameters, and then he'd, I'd say, well, go behind this certain other console. Go behind the ECOM console and read me out these kind of parameters. What I was looking for was patterns. Uh, instrumentation failures, when they happen, fail in patterns. And uh, parameters that uh, normally have nothing to do with each other, or measurements that have nothing to do with each other, do through, come through a common communication system. So there's single points where they get aggregated together. And if you have failures in those single points, they aggregate into weird combinations. But knowing what the failure modes are and the detailed design of the circuitry, you can understand whether or not it's a real problem or a, a measurement problem that has caused the problem. Well, he went through the sequence, read a bunch of measurements to me, and I said, well, it's not that. Read me some more. I said, read me these. I said, Arnie, my conclusion is I'm not sure what has happened there, but, but for one thing is for sure that is a real problem. That is not an instrumentation or measurement procedure problem. Now, that's a real problem. I'll be right there, but uh, tell those guys it's not an instrumentation problem. That's a real problem they're chasing. I'm not sure what happened, but I'll be there. So I, I, I jumped in my clothes and came onto the console, not onto the console, uh, uh, from that point. And rather than plugging into the console, I started just uh, walking behind each operator, looking at what they were chasing, what indications they were looking at, what they thought the problem was in each of their own individual area, because they were pursuing their own anomaly, their own perception of what caused the anomaly, and its own solution. So I just kind of came in and surveyed the room to to see what I could correlate that made sense out of the whole thing. Once the, uh, of course, the command and service module got powered down and, and the, the problem was kind of transferred to the lunar module, uh, we went to work on a checklist to, uh, to uh, if we can get back around from the moon, to get the spacecraft activated uh, with a minimum amount of power to, uh, to pull off the entry sequence, because we eventually had to give the lunar module up because it, it doesn't, doesn't have a heat shield, of course. You can't come back through the Earth's atmosphere with the lunar module. It had to be the command module. The, the biggest checklist work went to how could we uh, design an activation sequence, a power-up sequence for the command module, such that we could start early enough to get it done in time, but start late enough that we had enough power to do it. So the real checklist work uh, that went on was associated with activating the command module in the proximity of the Earth when we came back around. And we spent days uh, uh, negotiating with the, with the people who need the power, allocating the power back out in form of a timeline, and then refining the checklist to the point we thought it might work, and then 
the crew, the backup crew and others spending time in simulators refining that checklist. That was the, the biggest checklist uh, work that we did, which, which literally took days, and that uh, allowed us to, uh, to activate and re-enter with the systems alive that we needed. We were in charge of allocating the power, and therefore became the power brokers for people to, uh, to come to us and negotiate timelines with. And one of the things I remembered, and this will this will probably be a good example, was that once you landed in the ocean, uh, you had a locator beacon, an emergency beacon, that, that these entry batteries that we were trying to preserve powered. And I was, uh, I was negotiating with the retro officer that uh, he, he wanted, one of the things he wanted his checklist insisted on was when we landed, uh, the recovery guys wanted this beacon turned on. And I finally said, no, we're not going to do it, guys. I said, you know, our biggest problem is getting you to an ocean. If I get you to an ocean, surely you can find it. I mean, I don't have enough power for discretionary stuff that uh, happens after you land. We're fighting a very critical problem trying to land. There were endless negotiations going on like that, that people said, I just got to have this piece of equipment on. And I said, well, we can't afford it. You got to do without it. You can't have it on as long as you think. We got to do stuff in reverse order because we were trying to literally re-enter with a power system that was probably 20% of the size that we could comfortably normally do the re-entry sequence with. The, the key thing, of course, in the command module was that we only had small batteries that you could use after you dumped the fuel cells. So we always dumped the fuel cells um, just before we came home. So these, these, linear, these entry batteries, or these emergency batteries, uh, had been used uh, to about half their capacity before we got the command module powered down that night. So, so one, one big contribution to the timeline of actually coming back home would be to recharge those batteries. There was a, a normal process of going to the, when you go into the moon and coasting to the moon that the command module supplied a little electrical power to the, to the lunar module. So it was designed to provide a, f a, f a few amps from the command module to the lunar module and that was to keep its inertial measurement system uh, all warm and stable uh, for the alignment layer. What, we, what you could do through a precarious route uh, is, is figure out some way to, to have that power transfer come backwards. That is, instead of transferring from the command module to the service, to the lunar module, would be to have the lunar module somehow get power into the command module and somehow we could arrange the circuitry such that the only thing that you would be powering inside the command module out of all the hundreds and thousands of switches and circuit breakers was just this little thing called a battery charger. We had a little battery charger in the uh, command module that if we could get power to, we could recharge those batteries. The, when we talked about initially doing that, a guy that worked for me at the time, named Jim Kelly, we were, uh, we were talking to the lunar module guys about, we need some power. You know, we, we think we might figure out a way to hook up a circuit if you could give us some power. Well, they their initial reaction was, look, we got problems of our own just getting you back. Uh, so we got, we got to keep all the power. So Jim Kelly and I sat down and said, well, let's, define a let's design a checklist anyway. It turned out to be very, a very good, uh, good thing to have because as we got later into the flight and came around the moon, the lunar module guys finally allowed us to have some power. Uh, and we were able to uh, devise this, this checklist and it must, I can't, I wish I had kept a copy of it. It had hundreds of circuit breakers that uh, the crew had to execute just in the right sequence to get into the sequence and get out of the sequence so that you not only ride the power through this precarious loop that wasn't intended, you also had to, uh, to configure the command module so that the only thing on in the whole command module was this little battery charger. And uh, we sent the crew over at this checklist, and they couldn't believe that we had devised this little multi-page checklist with hundreds of circuit breakers and switches and all that on it to, uh, to, to actually get to the battery charger. But it worked, and the crew executed it uh, every time perfectly, as far as we know, because it was done in the blind. We had no information coming out of the command module that, of how it was going, whether or not it was going all right.